Hello, everybody. This is Christy Hool coming at you with another episode of Classroom Matters. I am so excited today to be sitting down and talking to none other than Kim Bearden, who is the co-founder of the Ron Clark Academy. Hey, Kim, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Christy. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm so excited to have you here. And I know that you are involved in a ton of stuff and you have uh, s- such an such an exciting background that I kind of just wanted to, to to jump off with you and talk a little bit about the Ron Clark Academy and sort of what that is and what you guys are doing. Sure. So I am the co-founder of the school with Ron Clark, and we are a middle school. Next year, we'll actually be adding fourth grade, but currently we're students in grades fifth through eighth, and we're located in Southeast Atlanta. But we teach our kids using lots of movement, lots of energy, really focus on ways to engage students, but still have high academic rigor. But probably what makes us most unique is that in addition to being a middle school, we're an educator training facility. And so almost every single week, educators from all over the world actually come to our school in Atlanta and they attend professional development. But what makes us unique about that is that they observe our classes in action. You know, in the world of professional development for teachers, quite often you're sitting in a theater to get the information. You know, you're sitting there listening to a PowerPoint. But we think that as teachers, if we could watch each other and grow from each other, then we would all um, really have exponential growth in this profession. And so educators come, they sit in our classes, they go from class to class, and they learn methods and techniques that they can take back to their classrooms as well. Not because we're perfect, because there's no such thing as a perfect teacher, But that whole idea of when you're sitting in a classroom reflecting upon, you know, what would I do the same? What would I do differently? How can I make this my own? That is a very powerful thing. So we're at 12 years in operation. And um, over the past 12 years, we've had well over 50,000 educators from around the world come to this tiny little warehouse in Southeast Atlanta to learn and grow. But this is my 32nd year as an educator. And during that time, I've done just about every role you can possibly imagine in the profession. (laughs) Okay, so I want to I want to ask you. So the Ron Clark Academy, number 1, I think it's fantastic that teachers are actually getting to see the strategies and techniques in action. Because as a former administrator, having to sit through professional development and try to explain to my teachers how to do something without kids <laughs> is really hard to do. And the second thing really quickly is I guess your kids there just get used to having all these folks come in and out of their classrooms all the time. <laughs> yes. You know, when we started the school, it was always our idea to have educators come and observe. We did want to make sure we protected our students and we wanted them to be comfortable, but they actually thrive off the energy. You know, the educators come here, we have stadium seating in the back of our classrooms and the kids grow very used to it. So a matter of fact, it's kind of comical. They're not observed all day long because, you know, they'll be observed maybe in this class and then this class. And sometimes they'll walk in my class and go, well, where are the educators? I say, well, baby, you're not being observed right now. Oh, well, why not? Why aren't they in here? So I think that they uh, like to show all that they've learned and they're very proud of it. But yeah, the idea of watching, you know, if you want to be a master surgeon, you operate alongside a master surgeon, or if you want to be a master carpenter, you build alongside one. In education, we're in silos. You know, you go through your student teaching experience, and if you're paired with a great teacher, that's wonderful, but many are paired with a mediocre teacher during that time. And so you've never really seen what excellence can look like. And even if we work with master teachers in our buildings, we interact with them, but we don't sit in their classrooms and watch them doing their craft. And so even at the building level, we need to do a whole lot more of that, of that sharing. And that is, I'm sure, a huge impact on the climate and culture that you have there at the Ron Clark Academy. Um, and that's something that I really want to talk with you about today, because I know that you have a lot of experience about that. You've you've talked about climate and culture um, across the nation to groups of teachers and businesses and organizations. And, and you know, as we were talking a little earlier before we started recording, I, I know that the climate and culture in a lot of school districts across the United States has dramatically changed, not just for, you know, in the realm of the kids, but also for the teachers. So you know, what What kind of climate and culture do you see happening in the Ron Clark Foundation or schools that's not necessarily happening in some of the other schools? You know, when educators come here, you are right. There's a lot of teachers that will share just that there's low morale. You know, they're overworked, they're overwhelmed, they're underappreciated. And that's a, such a frustration because educators do so much. But when educators come and I try to articulate just very clearly, who are we? You know, know, people have seen a lot of viral videos about our kids singing and dancing and music and things like that. And that is a part of who we are. But we're also very academically rigorous. We teach discipline, manners, respect to our students. And so one of the first things I show educators when they come here is a visual. And so if you could just imagine a set of scales 
And on one side of the scales, you have discipline, manners, respect. That's important. You have to have that. You have to have a safe, structured environment, free from distractions, so students feel like they are in a place that is set up for learning. I think we would all agree with that. That's important. It's vital. And so we base our discipline over the, um, off of the Essential 55, a book that Ron Clark wrote many, many years ago. But it's about 55, not even necessarily rules, but expectations, how we treat each other, how we respect one another, how we lift each other up. And so the rules and the discipline are very, very vital and important. But if that's all you have, then you got prison, right? <laughs> There's a lack of joy. Yeah. There, there you know, students, I, I, I have the opportunity and it's a great opportunity to visit many, many schools all over the country because I go and speak in schools as well as having educators come here. And I, I've seen many wonderful schools. But there are times when I'll see a school where the kids are mannerable, they're respectful, they're well behaved. But when you see them walking up and down the hallway, they look like they're serving time. I mean, they're just, there's, there's True. a yeah. complete and total lack of joy. They look miserable. And I don't think every day should be a birthday party because we're about business in school. We got stuff to do. But I do think there should be joy associated with learning because then kids will want to be lifelong learners. So that's on one side of the scales. Then on the other side, though, equally important, completely balanced with it, you have passion, creativity, enthusiasm. Because when you have that, it's the kind of place where students want to be, where they want to learn. There's, there's joy, there's energy, there's, the kids are passionate, the teachers are passionate. And if that's all you have, though, you got chaos, right? You have to balance it with that. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, oh, we're going to be creative and joyful because you have to have the structure in place. When you have that balance and blend, then you're able to have that academic rigor because it's a safe structure environment where kids can learn, but it's a joyful, enthusiastic place so kids want to learn. And it's hard. It's hard to create that. You know, we say that it starts with us as a staff and we talk about it so often. You know, one of the, the first things you have to do is have discussions about it. Just like they say, you know, if you want a strong marriage, you have to talk about it. You have to work at it. We work at our climate and culture as much as we work at test scores, you know, because we think that if you have the test, the climate culture, the test scores will follow. And right. so there's a lot of discussions about it. How do we lift each other up? How do we support each other so we don't feel like we're all bearing the burden? And I often tell people what's really important is that you must exude what you hope to create. You must exude what you hope to create. So in your classroom, if you want enthusiastic, joyful, engaged learners, well, then as the teacher, you have to be enthusiastic, joyful and engaged. You know, if you want to work with people who are kind and supportive and uplift each other, then you have to be kind and supportive and uplift others, even when they're not doing the same. And that can be hard because sometimes life gets in the way. Sometimes we have personal issues. We all go through those kinds of trials. I'm a, I'm a mom of four. I've, I've been a single mom. I've been divorced. You know, I'm re happily remarried now, but I've been through all kinds of different, you know, trauma in my personal life. And it's like, you know, you still got to go in that classroom and try to lift up those kids. That's a lot. But I found that when you focus on lifting those kids up, it actually pulls you up. You know, it, it can become a source of empowerment for you by empowering them. Yeah. And I think that those rules not only apply, obviously, in schools, because we want to exude that joy and enthusiasm in front of the kids. And, and we want to make sure that they know that they're loved and that the relationship piece is there and then the learning will follow. But I think that's also really vital in any organization, not just a school, any organization where you work and you have a collaborative culture of people coming together with the same goal in mind. Um, you know, it kind of reminds me of your, your story in your book about the airline and when you lost your luggage and the, the gal that was in the baggage claim area, you know, and just your, your approach to her the second time when you went back in there really changed her approach back to you. Right. You know, in our day to day lives, you know, some jobs, you know, I, yeah, I, I gave the story about, you know, some lost luggage and I had a woman who was not very helpful. But, um, and so I left, I went to go buy clothes at the Walmart, came back and see my luggage <laughs> in a small remote town. You know, it was just, it was, I had a big speech the next morning. It was all these, everything could go wrong. Just a comedy of errors. But I sat there on a bench and I watched her walk across the, the baggage plane toward me. And I saw her differently. I saw a broken woman. I saw someone who was overworked, overwhelmed, sad. And I thought, you know, that job, every single person that comes to you has an issue. Like it's not a job <laughs> where it's exciting because every person is complaining. And so I went in the second time and I, you know, and I told her, I said, you know, you're the most significant person in my world right now. I really appreciate you. It must be frustrating having a job where you're trying to correct problems that you didn't create. You know, you're trying to solve problems that somebody else created. And I just need you to know that you can significantly make an impact upon my day, you know, but I said it sincerely. And because um, it was coming from a genuine place. 
And it was amazing how her body language, she smiled, she stood up straight. It was like this release. It was almost this weight that came off her because you could tell that nobody had said that to her in a while. And she was doing the very best that she could at that time. You know, what I found interesting about that story was it wasn't something that you were able to do like right off the bat because you were dealing with your own frustrations. But when you had time to kind of stop and think about it, and I think that's the piece that we're missing sometimes is like if you have a few minutes to step, to step back, think about it, think about the other person, you know, because you went to Walmart and you, you know, you had a little bit of time before you went back to, to meet with her again. And so you had that time to really think about how you needed to approach the situation differently. And so I think that's an important component of that, too that it's not always going to happen instantaneously. Absolutely. Because we're human. We are. But sometimes we have to get outside of ourselves. You know, you, you mentioned briefly my book. So the book that I wrote, Talk to Me, it is about these six principles for how we interact with others, how we um, how we communicate more effectively, but also get things done. You know, And in the book, the very first two principles really are all about mindset. You know, it's never the words you say that are as important as the sincerity with which you say them. And, you know, that first principle is the one of consideration. You must always take into consideration there's more to the story than you'll ever know, that other people have burdens, they have struggles, they have challenges. And um, it doesn't mean you allow people to bully you or mistreat you by any means. But if you have a consideration mindset, you're often able to step back and deliver information and with the appropriate tone, the appropriate body language, even with the appropriate timing in a way that the person can receive it. And the second principle is this idea of motivation. You know, we have motivators when we go into our conversations. Sometimes we're motivated by very sincere, great ones like, you know, uh, insight and wisdom and productivity and solutions. But other times we're motivated by things like anger, frustration, our ego, our self-esteem, our insecurities, jealousy. And when those are your motivators, the conversation's not going to go well. You know, you're, you're going to go on the attack or, you know, it's just going to be that you're trying to manipulate the situation. So in that situation, I had to stop and go, okay, what is really my motive here? And, and, you know, part of it was, I thought, you know what, I want to make this woman's day better. (laughs) Yes, I wanted to get my luggage. I wanted some solutions, but I sincerely thought, you know what, this woman's having a really bad day too. What if I could make her day a little brighter? And, you know, and, and I also took into consideration that, you know, she obviously had been through a lot. You could just tell by looking at her. She's one of those people that just probably looked a lot older than she really was because she had just mm-hmm. been down. She looked like she'd had a hard life. And, you know, going back to the book, I know I actually had that on my list to chat with you about later, but it, it really, it really is such a good book. And it, it, is really not just applicable to teachers. And I think that's what I want my listeners to realize is whatever profession you're in, and even if you're just a mother or a parent or, you know, people that you meet on a daily basis, the principles in this book are truly geared towards all other human interaction that you have throughout your life, not just in a teaching environment. Um, but you know, I really wanted to touch on, cause I want to talk in a little bit about teacher stress and, and I know that a lot of us work, you know, and I did as well, uh, a, a school system that has a lot of kiddos that are struggling, a lot of families that are struggling. And you tell a lot of stories about folks that are struggling and kids that aren't, you know, don't have food or don't have lights. And there's lots of, of, of stories in there about individual kids. But I think one of the stories that really stuck out to me in this book was a story about Katrina, who was on the opposite side of the spectrum. She was a child that came from a good home. She was a child that had good parents, but expected so much of her and expected her to be perfect that that was also a difficult way for her to live. But it just is not the way that we think of kids struggling all the time. Absolutely. You know, I've been very blessed in my 32 year career to have taught in schools with very different demographics, all different kinds of schools. And um, I've taught, you know, the school where I teach currently now, about 80 percent of my kids come from low wealth situations. Now, I do have some very wealthy families here, too, but the majority of my kids um, do come from low wealth situations. But I taught for nine years at one of the most affluent schools in the state of Georgia. <laughs> and I taught students who um, th- their parents drove incredible cars. I'll probably never drive and, and lived in huge houses. And some of those kids had the hugest holes in their hearts of any kids I've ever met. And so I think we do a disservice when we don't realize that all kids need support and all kids need love and all kids have challenges and struggles. And it, you know, it doesn't matter. You may have, um, live in a nice house and have nice things, but you could still have a very big hole in your heart. And yeah, she was a student that the parents had put so much pressure on her, um, that she developed an eating disorder. Um, she couldn't, she couldn't function because it was just like, the you know, she had to be perfect. She'd be perfect and, 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 and to project, you know, perfection all the time. And, 
And that can be very, very exhausting and very, very difficult as well. And, and there are a lot of kids like that who are just hurting, you know, you know, I've taught kids that mama's not around because she's working three jobs to put food on the table, but I've taught kids that mama's not around because she left the kids with the nanny and she's off on cruises all the time and doesn't have time for the kids, you know, but either way, it, they manifest themselves differently, but in both situations, mama's gone, you know, and so you still have a hole in the heart there. And so we have to realize that all kids need to be in an environment where they have ed uh, educators who will uplift them and support them and love them and, and push them, challenge them, but also see see within them and see their needs and, and really develop those relationships with them. And so along those same lines, do you think we have an epidemic of teacher stress right now with all the different types of kids that we have coming through the school systems and the different parenting and, and all of the issues that we see happening these days? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I just, I respect teachers so much because I, well, I am one, but I, I get, you know, one of the blessings of my job is I've gotten to meet so many educators because thousands come through our doors every year. And then I get to travel all over the country and meet educators and they're just extraordinary human beings. And they're trying to do so much with so little. And, and, you know, and honestly, they're underpaid, too. And so you have teachers who are going, you know, w working all day long and then going to wait tables or even drive the school bus to and from mm -hmm. school mm -hmm. to be able to pick up that extra paycheck to be able to take care of their own families. And then they're still taking uh, money out of their own pockets to buy pencils for their students or to buy that pair of shoes for that kid that they care about. And they know that that child needs a pair of shoes. And and so, you know, it's interesting. I it, I know that people say, well, you shouldn't be in teaching for the pay. Well, obviously we're not because, <laughs> because we wouldn't go in the first place. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a society where teachers were valued and, and that they did receive compensation where they didn't have to worry about putting food on the mm -hmm. table or they didn't have to worry about their own kids' education and things like that. Because, you know, when we go to bed at night, people say, well, only, they only work during, you know, they have off during the summer. But the teachers I know, during the summer they're working. They're either doing professional development, they're working on lesson plans, and we never – completely disengaged from our hearts and our minds from thinking about our kids that we worry about at night. You know, you lie in bed at night and you worry about certain kids and how you're going to reach them and how you're going to teach them and what you can do for them. And so just even the emotional stress of that is, it's a lot, it's a lot to bear. And so I think one of the you know most important things, of course, we want society to respect us, but we've got to be there for each other. We've got to be champions for each other. You know, I, I tell my staff, one of the greatest things they can do first is that we got to lift up each other because then it gives us the strength to be able to lift up our kids. And so we talk about that often. You know, what does that look like? What does that sound like? You know, it's not just we should be in our little silos looking out for ourselves, but what do you need? I got you. How can I help you? And really taking time to share with each other what we see in each other. You know, gosh, you did an amazing job. I see. Thank you for always being the person who does this. Thank you for showing up. Thank you. We really spend a lot of time on that validating and appreciating each other because um, people need that. That that fuels the soul. That's what keeps you going when you feel like you can't go any further. And it's not just at the teacher level either because as as yourself being a, a administrator – as well as a teacher, you know, you're talking about teachers being recognized and they do, you know, and I, and I totally get that. And I taught for 10 years and it did feel sometimes like you were just being forgotten about, but your whole life was, you were engulfed with these kids and you loved them and you nurtured them and you thought about them at night. And then no one was really taking the time to recognize you. And, but then being in a role as an administrator as well, just like you were, um, you know, is the same issue that as an administrator, we we kind of lack that getting recognized as well from people in central office. And so it kind of is a trickle down effect sometimes. Oh, absolutely. You know, I've been I am an administrator. I'm the executive director of the school. And Ron and I are both the administrators here. In addition to being a classroom teacher, administrators, it's a very lonely job because yeah. you are putting out fires you didn't create a lot of times. And a lot of times you have to make decisions that other people don't necessarily understand, but you have to be confidential about the decisions you've made. And it can be a very lonely place to be. And even if we're not only looking at it from the educator's perspective, I'm also a parent. And, you know, it can be lonely and difficult yeah. being a parent too, you know, there's, and so I think that the key here is that we all, you know, it's not like we should do everything we do to get credit. That's, that's certainly not it because life isn't about us. It's about lifting up other people, but we should mm -hmm. take the time to do that, to lift up other people and, and to really come to the table. And so we work really hard. You know, we mentioned climate and culture. We work really hard to develop the rapport with our parents too. Um, I constantly, you know, tell mamas, I appreciate you. You're amazing. You're a great mama. You know, if a child, if I have to in, um, give discipline to a child, you know, sometimes in consequences, and, you know, that's not the fun part of being an administrator. 
But, you know, mamas will sometimes cry because they're embarrassed their child made a bad decision or they're, you know, or ashamed. And I, and I tell them, I say, all kids make mistakes just because your child did something that was not <laughs> their normal character. That doesn't mean you're a bad mama. It doesn't mean your child has shamed the family. It just means that child is learning and growing and they made a decision, a bad decision. And parents need to hear that, you know, because yeah. you're like, oh my gosh, if you know my child, I can't believe I didn't raise my child to do that. And I, and I always remind mamas, I know you didn't. I know you raised mm-hmm. your child better than that. This is just what part of being a kid. They're growing up and they're learning. That's why consequences are important, but but I see who you are as a mother. I see how hard you're working for it. There's no handbook for this because every child is different. Every child learns different, every, differently. Every child receives um, discipline differently. And so we have, to, we have to come together. And I think a lot of the stress in our schools is because I think we're all, you know, it's parents versus teachers versus administration. Instead of us all being a team, we're, we're kind of all coming at it from different lenses and we're kind of butting heads sometimes instead of supporting each other. Yeah. For sure. Um, so you've written two books. We've talked a little bit about this, the newest one, Talk to Me. and But that's not your only book. You've also written a Crash Course, The Life Lessons My Students Taught Me. Yes. So my very first book was that. It's it's actually a collection of just lots of different stories over my lifetime. You know, I realized when I sat down to write my first book that many of the uh, qualities that, that I have nurtured over my years is, you know, things like resilience and strength and forgiveness and joy and magic and all those different things. I really learned those lessons from kids, Um, just watching my students in different scenarios and different settings. You know, children are so resilient and they are so strong and there's something so magical and beautiful and pure about them. And and so I tell a lot of stories of, of things I did well, things I didn't do well, but what I learned along the way, and it's all told through different scenarios. Now, in in cases where it was appropriate, obviously I I changed the name of the student or maybe just enough minor detail where um, it would be slightly different. But, um, but it, the, the, the spirit of all the stories are things that I really have, have gone through over the course of my 30 year, two year career. Yeah, they're fantastic. And, and I cannot say enough. I have not made it all the way through um, crash course, but I've, I've read talk to me through a couple of times and I've got my little tabs in there and I, (laughs) I kind of try to remember some of those things just as I'm even being a mother to my children. And I'm, I'm, you know, some of the same, same situations as you as like people in the airport and Walmart. And, um, it's really is important information. And, um, I love the red shoes. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, is that like, like, is she really wear the red shoes? Because you know, they're on every chapter. (laughs) Yes. Well, I dress very professionally for work, but today I'm in a really nice red dress, but I have high, uh, high top chucks on today, but they're plaid. So I wear, (laughs) so on the cover of talk to me, I am wearing some red, uh, red Converse tennis shoes. And it really became sort of my trademark. I years ago, I, when my son was twelve, we were playing on the beach. To make a long story short, I broke my toe when I was kicking him out of fun. No, not out of not out of anger. And so he had his shoes on on the beach. I don't even know where that came from. But so after the boot uh, was really you know difficult for me to manipulate because I run around my classroom and I realized Converse would be more comfortable. And so I started to just collect them in all different colors. But I always gravitate toward the red ones. And so. I wear them with my dresses quite often. I'll have a nice dress, but I wear different Converse and it's kind of my own little style. Not every day, but a lot. So when I was designing the cover for the book, I thought I wanted, I didn't want to put my face on the book, but I thought I do want it to be like, you know, the the book is talk to me. Tell me about you. I'm going to tell you about me. And and I want it to be like, come, come here, be with me. And so people who know me would know that if they just see the red shoes, that it's, it's me. And it really is. That picture was taken. Uh, this brilliant photographer friend of mine took it in my kitchen. So those are my feet <laughs> on the cover of the book. We just put a black sheet down and, and, and we took the, the pictures of my shoes. So, but it, it's just supposed to be kind of uh, make, be approachable. I think is, is the message. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it, it absolutely works because like, as you know, as people are flipping through the book, they're obviously going to remember the shoes and they're also, you know, obviously in the, in the book, there are sort of the, the headings of your six principles. There's the little, you know, sketch of the shoes. So I, I, I think it's very clever and I, and I will think about those shoes when I think about you and the work that you've done. So it definitely worked. And if I ever make it to the Ron Clark Academy, that's how I'll, I'll know I'll be able to find You'll you. You'll be able to find um, me. And, yeah, and as I just look for your you know, there's this great book out called Girl, Wash Your Face. Some of y'all have read that book yes. probably. Love it. But she has on red chucks on the front. But she, her book came out before mine, but I really had done the whole cover before it did. So people said, is that where you got it? Were you doing trying to do be like Rachel Hollis? I said, well, I think she's fantastic. But 
I actually was just trying to be like me and we both like red chuck. So maybe we got a little bit of something in common. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I want to kind of get serious for a second because I really want to focus on, you know, the teacher stress epidemic. So people come and watch you speak. And if anyone has heard you speak, I've, I've seen videos of you speak and I'm inspired sitting watching you in my home office, watching you speak to these crowds of people. And I get up and I think, wow, I'm so inspired and I'm so filled with joy and things I want to do. But I think in, in reality, we have those feelings and then we go back to our classrooms or to our daily lives and a couple of days go by and it sort of starts to fade, right? Because we kind of get sucked back into reality and, you know, maybe we've got all kinds of issues going on. So what are some things that you can quickly tell our listeners to sort of keep that momentum going? If they were to go and watch one of your videos and feel super inspired and energetic and excited how can they continue feeling that way in a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, and not let that teacher stress get to them? Right. Well, you know, it does get to me sometimes too. So I won't stand here and act like it, you know, it does not. But I, you know, I, I share when I talk to crowds a lot, I share about my own personal journey and when I went through some dark times in my personal life, but yet I was expected to go in that classroom and have passion, enthusiasm, joy but I felt broken. And it's hard for a broken teacher to have anything left to give to broken students, you know, because we're just trying to do the best we can. Sometimes it's a victory just to get out of bed. But what I realized, you know, I was actually share how I was just lying on the floor, sobbing my eyes out when I had been horribly betrayed. I had a husband who had um, been very, very unfaithful and it all came crashing down. I found out and and I just, you know, I felt so broken and small and powerless. I think that's a, a common theme. And then one night it occurred to me, you know, maybe I was defining power wrong. You know, if you define power as your ability to control things, well, that can never happen. We can't control everything. But I realized maybe a greater kind of power is when I empower others. You know, because when you empower others, the exponential ripple effect goes on forever. Like long after I've left this world, the, the people that I've uplifted, they will uplift others. They will uplift others. Um, I don't know if you ever thought about it, but when you affect a child, you don't just only affect that child. Indirectly, you affect that child's future spouse and children, extended family members, neighbors, colleagues, business partners, employees, everybody that that child will one day affect. Indirectly, you've had an impact upon as well. And then if you multiply that by the number of kids in your classroom, you multiply that by the number of years you're in this profession. Without a doubt, it could be in the millions of lives that are affected by yours. And you won't know all these people's names and stories. They won't all know your name or your story. But you should still rest at night when you go to sleep and you've had some of those days you think, why am I, you know, does this matter? Am I making a difference? The answer is always yes. It is. You have significance. We have a profession of significance. And I thought a lot about that word significance too. You know, I'm also a kind of a type A achievement driven kind of person, but I realized when all this was going on that no longer did I want to seek achievements. I wanted to seek significance and it's a different lens. You know, Achievement is about getting things, but significance, you know, it's, it's about being something. It's about really trying to have an impact upon the world through uplifting others. And so when I do feel, it sounds so Pollyanna-ish, I guess, but when I'm feeling my lowest, I try to get outside of myself and say, what can I go do to make somebody else's day brighter? And it always makes my day brighter. And, um, and so that's kind of how I, I focus that. And, and I just stop to reflect on those kids that you are reaching, you know, sometimes you'll get an email from a parent and it just takes your breath away because it's hurtful and it, and it, you know, you're doing right by that kid, but that parent's upset and it seems irrational, something like that. But you've got to not put all of your energy focusing on that. You've got to listen to it. If there's something you need to do, but, but you need to focus on thinking about every one of those faces in your classroom that you're having an impact upon exponentially. You're making a huge dent in this world. You are having an impact that not a lot of other professions can say that they have. Definitely. And, and I think revisiting what you've written on occasion too is helpful. You know, I got up this morning and I, I've read through your books a couple of times and I, you know, I read a little bit when I got to the station, browse back through and I, I honestly it already felt a little bit better about the day. So, you know, I think just having those, those pieces uh, weave in and out of your day and in and out of your week is also helpful. So the two books, obviously people can get them on Amazon, uh, but I believe you also have them on your website, uh, KimBearden.com. Yes. And they can find out all other um, interesting things about you, um, videos on there, your books, uh, stories about your life. Um, so uh, KimBearden.com. What else do you have coming up this summer? 
What else can we look forward well, to? Every summer, I kind of hit the road. I, I, I have the opportunity to visit school districts all over the country uh, and also, also women's groups and other organizations. But primarily, I go to school districts and I do combinations of things. Sometimes I do keynote addresses just to kind of give that inspiration, that motivation. Sometimes I do really um, workshops on different topics, everything about effective communication, climate and culture, um, classroom strategies to get kids engaged. I, um, if you follow me on Instagram, I'm at Kim Bearden and on Twitter, I'm at Kim Bearden. And, and you'll see there's a lot of different kinds of lesson ideas and things that I share, but I go and do day long workshops or even just one hour workshops. So I will be, uh, last summer, I think I was in 33 cities, um, <laughs> last summer. So this summer we're still getting it all booked up and finalized. So I don't know the total count, but I'm everywhere from Wyoming to Texas, to Florida, to um, everywhere in between. So I'm, I'm on the road going to do different things for different districts. And I guess if anybody's listening and they want to know how to um, how to reach out to me and, and, and book something like that, actually, if you go to my Instagram, there's a little, I um, mean, you go to my bio, it'll tell you how to contact me for bookings for that. So if you come to St. Louis this summer, let us know. I'd love to have you actually in the studio um, and talk about some other things that would be great. Do you drag your family around with you or how does that you work? No, I do sometimes. I have three sons whom I adopted from Soweto, South Africa, which is um, a whole other uh, episode of a podcast because that's yeah. quite a beautiful life-changing thing. And I also have a daughter who's fully grown. She's 29 and on her own. But I've, I've brought a couple of my sons sometimes they, and, and let them tell parts of their stories before. It kind of depends on if they're in school or not because they, they go back to school earlier than I do. But they're, they're now about to be seniors in high school. So Oh, they, wow. they're, they're getting their first jobs and all. So maybe a little different, look a little different this summer. <laughs> maybe going solo. Right. <laughs> well, Kim, I cannot tell you what an honor and a pleasure it has been to have this conversation with you. Um, the work that you're doing is so important. I mean, I, I don't even know what other word to say, but it's just important. And um, any of you that are listening, please check out the site, get her books. It's a quick, easy read, but it's one that you will come back to um, over and over again when, I, when I'm talking about the Talk to Me book. It really is effective um, ways that you can just move forward with your life and, and have a more, like she said, significant life. So Kim, thank you so, so very much. Thank you for having me on, Christy. You have a great day. And that is the end of this episode of Classroom Matters with Christy Hool. Uh, we will see you next time. 